Now it is time for the last word with Ali Velshi, who is in for Lawrence. Good evening, Ali. Absolutely amazing reporting. Thank you for, for uh, highlighting that. Alex, you have a great evening. You too. It was only a couple of weeks ago that Donald Trump's supporters told us not to believe our lying ears when Donald Trump said this. We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. Relax. He wasn't talking about a bloodbath, bloodbath. He was just talking about a bloodbath for the country involving the auto industry. Trump's allies told us that. Political analysts told us that. Heck, even some journalists told us, told us that. OK, so Trump was referring to cars yesterday, or was he, in Michigan when he spoke at a lectern bearing the words, stop Biden's border bloodbath? It was during those remarks that Trump claimed he spoke with the family of a murder victim named Ruby Garcia, a 25-year-old woman who was allegedly killed by an undocumented immigrant. Except he didn't. He did not speak with any of us, Ruby's sister Marvie Garcia said in an interview. So it's kind of shocking seeing that he had said he had spoken with us, misinforming people on live TV, end quote. NBC News reports when asked to confirm if Trump had indeed spoken with a member of Ruby Garcia's family, the Trump campaign declined to comment on the record. Now, this specific deception feeds into the violent, dehumanizing way that Trump uses the issue of immigration to try to terrorize his way back to the Oval Office. Trump wants you to believe that we live in a violent, treacherous nation where his political rivals are vermin, and he alone, as he says it, stands between you and an invasion of animals, also his words, at the border. This playbook is tried and true the world over. It depends on people not reading history and knowing that this dupe has been tried and has worked masterfully before. But forget about history for the moment. Let's just rewind to what Trump said about immigrants in this country in December. You know, when they let, I think the real number is 15, 16 million people into our country, when they do that, we got a lot of work to do. They're poisoning the blood of our country. You've heard plenty of people tell you that Trump was echoing the words of Adolf Hitler there. Maybe you don't believe that. Maybe you don't think he really did that. Maybe you think it's just a coincidence that Trump used the phrase poisoning the blood of our country. But none of that would be true. For educational purposes, the University of Oklahoma has available online an English language translation of the 11th chapter of Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Remember now, Trump said people immigrating into the United States were poisoning the blood of our country. In Chapter 11 of Mein Kampf, a chapter titled Nation and Race, Hitler wrote, quote, all great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning. In a softball right wing radio interview, Trump was confronted about this and he said, quote, I never knew that Hitler said it. I know nothing about Hitler. I'm not a student of Hitler. I never read his works, end quote. Never read his works. Now, remember that Trump has not shied away from saying great things about other autocrats and strongmen. He said Hungary's despotic le leader, Viktor Orban, is fantastic. He called North Korea's murderous dictator, Kim Jong-un, very honorable. Trump threw the entire Western alliance into a tailspin when, as president of the United States of America, he denigrated the work of his own intelligence community and parroted Vladimir Putin's criticisms of the United States. America's decades-long subjection to Donald Trump is littered with hateful and violent words and actions. Donald Trump has refused still to apologize for taking out full-page newspaper ads in four New York City newspapers in 1989, calling for the death penalty for the Central Park Five, five black and Latino men who were wrongfully convicted as teenagers for the rape of the New York City jogger. As a candidate in 2016, Donald Trump said he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and not lose any voters. In that same campaign, he promised to pay the legal bills of any of his supporters who beat up protesters at his rallies. 
On his inauguration day, he gave a dystopian and ominous speech invoking the phrase American carnage. As president, Donald Trump said there were, quote, very fine people on both sides, end quote, after an innocent woman was murdered in Charlottesville, Virginia, during a riot between demonstrators and neo-Nazis. The night before that deadly riot, those same white supremacists marched through the campus of the University of Virginia with torches, chanting, Jews will not replace us, and blood and soil, which is an English translation of a Nazi slogan. At a presidential debate in 2020 against Joe Biden, Donald Trump, as president, told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by. At his rallies, Donald Trump is calling those jailed for the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol patriots. Those imprisoned are hostages. The same people who pledged to hang Mike Pence, who repeatedly assaulted and threatened to kill Capitol Police officers, who built a gallows with a noose outside the Capitol building and desecrated the halls of Congress. Today, a federal judge sentencing a man convicted of assaulting law enforcement said, we cannot condone the normalization of the January 6th U.S. Capitol riot. But condone that violence is exactly what Donald Trump and the Republican Party are doing. This week, Donald Trump, the presidential nominee of the party of Abraham Lincoln, had to be gagged by a New York judge after making threatening attacks against the judge's daughter. Here's the thing. Violence is who Donald Trump is. He uses violent words, wielding them like weapons in his effort to hold on to power and make you afraid of him, of the others, of the immigrants. It doesn't matter as long as you are afraid. But it doesn't have to be this way. You shouldn't give over your fear to Donald Trump, but you also can't ignore him. He counts on the fact that some will follow him into the fire of his creation, but most will look away in horror, hoping time will make it all go away. Time will not make it all go away. Throughout this nation's history, many wise Americans have offered wisdom in the face of political violence. And it may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people who will bomb a church in Birmingham, Alabama, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. In other words, things don't get better for those who wait. Things only get better for those who act. Leading off our discussion tonight is Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University. He's the author of The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America, and many other books. Uh, professor Snyder, I, I, you and I have just talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, but I think it was important to come back because Donald Trump on a daily basis now is doing things that shock those of us who don't think we can be further shocked. And the question is not that you shouldn't be shocked by it. It's what you are supposed to do about it. Uh, we were talking just this weekend about how he posted a picture of a truck that was decorated, uh, wrapped to look like Joe Biden uh, with a bullet in his head was hogtied in the bed of that truck. And some people say you're making too much of that kind of thing. What's the danger of normalizing this? Yeah, I, the, the problem is what Trump is doing is he's changing what is normal. He's getting us used to the idea that violent words, violent phrases, indirect threats, stochastic violence, that this is all, this is normal. And of course, our whole political system is based on the idea that you can have a constitution, a social contract, an agreement to hand over power peacefully. And so what one has to be able to do is to say, this is the kind of person who, if elected or if who gets close to power, will automatically undo the system. And that's what one has to understand and be calm about it and make that a reason to make sure that this person doesn't get close to power. Get close to power is an interesting term. You made a reference to this in a recent article uh, that you wrote on your Substack. Getting close to power is not the same as winning power. Uh, you, you've made the point that Donald Trump is setting up a situation in which on November 5th, he doesn't actually have to win more votes than, than Joe Biden to achieve his goals. I don't think in any of these elections in 16 or 20 or 24, Trump has ever believed that he was going to win. And at every single time, he said in one in one version or another that it was going to be stacked against him, people were going to cheat, it was going to be rigged against him. 
I don't think he has ever actually had the notion that he was going to win the popular the electoral vote. I think each time, but now with increasing violence and I think an increasing fervor and fear on his side, he's just tried to get close enough that he could stage something. I think he was genuinely surprised in 2000, in 2016 when he won. I think he was not surprised in 20 when he lost. He was ready for that. He'd been advertising for months that he was going to try something if he failed to win. And this time he's made it clearer than ever. He's making it very clear to us that his whole game is to just get reasonably close in November and then see what he can try to pull off. So we have more time to make sure that he doesn't get reasonably close. And also we have more time to try to head off the various extra legal things he could try in November. So let's and, and you talk about this and you say, let's be calm, which is good. We don't have to we don't have to lose. You know, our hair, hair doesn't have to be on fire about this, but you can't do nothing. You can't wish it away. You can't decide because you don't like to hear Donald Trump's voice that you shouldn't hear what he's got to say. So what's your guidance for people who really don't want to listen to Donald Trump? They don't they don't believe they're going to vote for him. They don't believe he's going to win the election. What is the thing that we're called upon to do other than vote on November 5th? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, the most important thing is to do something also because of your mood, because what Trump is trying to do, among other things, is to demoralize everybody. He's trying to make everything seem dirty. He's trying to make politics seem dirty. He's trying to make the good people seem just like him. You know, his whole strategy or part of his strategy is to try to make the Biden administration seem just like a version of him. Everybody's bad. So just pick your flavor of bad. But when you yourself do something good, some little thing, letter to the editor of the newspaper, conversation with somebody at a bar, phone banking, calling your congressman about legislation, any little thing that you do, campaign for candidates that you care about, giving, donating money to people, especially down ballot, any little thing that you do then makes you feel better, especially if you do it with other people. And then you get a positive cycle going where you're doing something good and you're feeling better about doing something good. And then at the end, you win, but also you know that there are lots of people around you who are also trying to do good things. And so you, you end up on the right side, but then you're not demoralized. You're actually, you're happy at the end of it, something like that. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about journalism. Um, you, you've got you know, this is a time when we should be introspective. We should be trying to, to, to get this as right as we can. Uh, what are the things that we should be doing now in in light of the fact that Donald Trump crosses new red lines on a daily basis? What's the way in which we cover this properly and provide the necessary context without being gratuitous or 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 creating unnecessary fear? Yeah. And number one is good old fashioned, just covering what the man says and does. I don't think there has been enough. And we talked about this last time. I don't think there's been enough simple coverage of the rallies. People need to know that the rallies begin with um, an appeal to people who have been convicted of crimes. They need to know that the rallies begin from the premise that there should be a violent overthrow of the American system. That's how every single rally begins. And I don't think people know that. The second thing is I, journalists have to accept that both sidesism is suicide for democracy. If you just say there are two sides to everything and I'm going to find my way into the middle, you're always going to give the people who want to overthrow the system an advantage because you're always going to be sharing your legitimacy with them. You're going to be giving your legitimacy to them. People have to be able to cover the election in such a way as to say, this person is A and this person is B, as opposed to I'm going to somehow find my way into the middle of them and give each side a voice. And it's really important, this is a third thing, not to talk about how the American people are divided. That makes it sound like, again, it's like one thing, one hand, uh -huh. other hand. It's not the people who are divided. It's that we have an extraordinary election in which we have an unusual candidate who has already tried to overthrow the system once and tells us basically every day that he's just aiming to get close enough that he can use violence to overthrow it again. That's what should be covered. Tim, we always appreciate it. Thank you for your continuing analysis. And I think we're going to have to have this conversation several more times before uh, November. Timothy Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and an author of a number of important books that are uniquely relevant in this moment. Coming up, the special counsel Jack Smith has a, a lot of strong words for Judge Aileen Cannon in a new filing, including that she is wrong on the law. But the most important words he wrote, appellate review. And that should have Judge Cannon running scared. Neil Katyal and Joyce Vance join me after a break. Aileen Cannon is wrong. 
Special Counsel Jack Smith did not mince words when he filed the government's response to Trump-appointed Judge Aileen Cannon's request for proposed jury instructions, including a jury instruction Cannon said she was considering that would essentially leave a jury no choice but to acquit Donald Trump. In a strong rebuke, Jack Smith repeatedly called Judge Cannon's interpretation of the Presidential Records Act wrong and said it would, quote, distort the trial, end quote, asserting bluntly that the Presidential Records Act has nothing to do with whether Donald Trump illegally retained classified documents in violation of the Espionage Act. Quote, it would be pure fiction to suggest that highly classified documents created by members of the intelligence community and military and presented to the president of the United States during his term in office were purely private, end quote. Jack Smith also points that, out that Donald Trump has never actually used that defense, that the documents were personal. Quote, Trump's entire effort to rely on the Presidential Records Act is not based on any facts. It's a post hoc justification that was concocted more than a year after he left the White House and in his invocation in this court of the Presidential Records Act is not grounded in any decision he actually made during his presidency to designate as personal any of the records charged, end quote. Jack Smith also made it clear that he's willing to take the issue back to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Quote, if, however, the court does not reject that erroneous legal premise, it should make that decision clear now, long before jeopardy att attaches, to allow the government the opportunity to seek appellate review, end quote. You'll remember that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has already twice reversed Judge Cannon, first after she blocked the government from accessing the documents seized from Mar-a-Lago, and then when it reversed her decision to appoint a special master to oversee the review of the documents. Joining us now, Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, who has argued 50 cases before the Supreme Court. He's a professor at Georgetown Law and the host of the pod podcast Courtside with Neil Katyal. Also joining us, Joyce Vance, former United States attorney. And before she was the United States attorney, she was the head of the U.S. Attorney's Appellate Division and was in charge of all matters before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Both are MSNBC legal analysts. Good evening to both of you. Joyce, let me start with you. I, I read a lot of legal terminology, um, but there is this talk of a rip, there is talk of jeopardy, and there is this discussion by Jack Smith to say, please make whatever decision you're going to make now, because if you don't do it now, we have a problem. What, what did he mean? Right. So here's the problem that happens with Eileen Cannon's refusal to issue a ruling on Trump's motion to dismiss under the Presidential Records Act. The reason Jack Smith says he's entitled to a decision now is that if she rules against him, he can appeal that in advance. He can go to the 11th Circuit and, and ask them to second guess. And the reality here is that virtually every legal expert who's not in the Trump camp who's looked at this issue says the Presidential Records Act has nothing to do with whether or not someone is illegally in possession of classified national defense information. So it seems pretty clear that the judge is in error territory. She's trying to delay ruling on that motion until after the trial starts. And here's why that matters. Once the jury is sworn in, double jeopardy attaches. And if she dismisses the case in Trump's favor after double jeopardy attaches, Jack Smith can't appeal her. He can't retry the case because the government can only try a defendant one time on a set of charges. And so what she's essentially trying to do here is to protect Trump, to insulate him behind a decision that she would make after the jury was impaneled when the government couldn't try him again and defeating the government's right to appeal. Jack Smith has finally decided to get tough, and he said, look, the clock is ticking here. He hasn't told her how much time she has, but he said, I need my ruling before we go to trial, and if I don't get it, I'll man damn you and ask the court to order you to rule correctly. Which has not gone her way a couple of times in the past. Uh, Neil, part of the problem, uh, and, and there, there are two issues here. One is the argument that, that Jack Smith makes about the Presidential Records Act. But the other one is this idea that the judge seems to be considering giving the jury an instruction that would be counter to the law. Um, it's, it's just that the instruction that she's considering about a president can do X, Y, and Z is not actually how the law is written. It's not a vague law about the Presidential Records Act. 
That's exactly right, Ali. And so what Smith did is take both of your points and basically say, you know, in legal terms, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, but it all boils down to, look, Judge Cannon, we've had enough, enough already. And basically saying to her, you're getting this totally wrong and you're delaying things and you're risking a double jeopardy acquittal. And so they used some very stern language and warned her, as Joyce says, that we are going to mandamus you, which means to say you were so clearly wrong, we're going to take this to an immediate appeal to the 11th Circuit and possibly even seek your removal as a judge in this case. Now, when I ran the Solicitor General's office, which is the office that controls all federal appeals, I had prosecutors from across the country that would come to me and ask for that and say, look, this judge is totally out of line. Don't let, don't, you know, we, we have to file this piece of paper, this mandamus and the like. And almost always we would say no. The typical thing of the Justice Department is be patient, let the system play out. But when you have a judge who's repeatedly erred the way this judge has, enough is enough. And in those rare circumstances, and it sure looks like this is one, that's when you seek mandamus and you possibly even seek the removal of a judge. That is something you do only as a very last resort. But unfortunately, Ali, we are at that stage. And so Smith's filing says, look, kids' gloves are off now. Uh -huh. We've been as patient as we possibly can with you, Judge, but this is it. Joyce, let's examine the question of fact. The question of law isn't really a question. I think that's the point that Jack Smith's trying to make, that the law on this is settled. The, the fact is interesting in that there's this whole debate over the Presidential Records Act and what the what Donald Trump would like there to be a debate about what, what he's allowed to do, but there's no actual assertion that he did any of that. There's no, he's, his team is not even asserting that he actually took any steps to create personal records or to determine what is, what is restricted or classified material. It, it, Jack Smith's point is, even if this were true, which it's not, it, none of it happened. Yeah, it's really incredible. Smith goes to a lot of trouble to go through this step by step, saying not only has Trump never said that he designated any of these records as personal, he's gone to a lot of trouble to craft an argument that lets him avoid saying that. He's made this argument that any time he takes stuff out of the White House and doesn't take it to the National Archives, but takes it someplace else, that means that it's automatically personal, not a presidential record. And Smith really makes mincemeat of this argument, pointing out that the, the records, the classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago are intelligence community documents created by the intelligence community shown to Trump in the course of his official work as the president of the United States. If anything is a presidential record, it's these sort of documents. And so the government is dead serious here. And, and Neil knows this better than I do, because when I was the appellate chief in the Northern District of Alabama, Neil was for a part of that time the acting solicitor general. If I wanted to take an appeal, I had to go to Neil's office for permission to do that. And as he says in these mandamus and recusal situations, it's very rarely given. But we know that Jack Smith has it here because federal prosecutors don't make empty threats. And if he talks about filing a motion to mandamus, that means he's already gone to the solicitor general. He's gotten her approval. The government is dead serious about getting this situation resolved. So, Neil, help play that out for me. If, if he's gone to the solicitor general and he has some approval, or at least he has some sense that this might actually uh, be the course he takes, what happens? So Smith is going to wait for Judge Cannon to try and, you know, resolve this. If she doesn't resolve it, then he's going to have to make a decision about when to file that motion before the 11th Circuit. But I suspect it's going to happen fairly soon. Um, you know, the clock is really ticking here. And just to underscore Joyce's point, I think I authorized one mandamus action in my time at the Justice Department from across the entire country, all 50 states. So it's something you do really rarely. And I remember going home that night and almost tearing up about it because it was such a grave step. Um, you know, and I don't think that Smith and the Solicitor General, to the extent she's involved already, um, is doing it in any other way. I mean, this is an extreme action, but sometimes when you have extreme decisions, they demand extreme action. And part of the extremeness of this, Joyce, is the timing, because Judge Aileen Cannon has been a remarkable slow walker. So if, uh, if Jack Smith decides to do this, 
How, what, at what speed would the, would the 11th Circuit act on this? And the, the context here is that the 11th Circuit has had the Aileen Cannon brief before them before. The 11th Circuit will move quickly. They've always been a circuit that's believed in fast action, and they've proven that in the two prior appeals of Judge Cannon's issues. And there's one more important thing to note here, Allie, which is that in this circuit, you know, every circuit, the law is a little bit different. It's fairly consistent. That's why we have a Supreme Court. But there's something a bit unusual down here, where the 11th Circuit has said, you know, we don't usually order judges to recuse from cases based on the way they've conducted that case. Usually, recusal requires some sort of a financial conflict of interest. But when a judge has been repeatedly reversed, we think that we have the authority to remove that judge from the case, not because the judge is a bad judge or we have any beef with the judge. We simply think it would be difficult, too difficult for them to set aside their earlier rulings. And so, in fact, in one of my cases, I think one that Neil authorized the appeal on, the 11th Circuit set aside the judge. It was their decision to do that for that precise reason. I think that we could very easily see them do something like that here. Neil, is there, if this all were to happen the way J Jack Smith wants it to happen, Jack Smith's goal is he wants this trial to, to occur. Is there still any possibility that this trial occurs before the election? Yes, absolutely. So Jack Smith's goal, his goal is to make sure the trial happens before the election, because if Donald Trump becomes president on day one, he will end this prosecution, as the president has the power to do to call off any prosecution, including one of himself. And Trump's goal, Ali, is exact reverse, which is to delay this trial until January 20th, hope he wins, and then, if he wins, nullify the prosecution. I still think there's absolutely time for this trial to happen. It should happen. The American people deserve to know what Donald Trump did with these extremely sensitive, classified, and otherwise documents. I can just tell you, before I was in the Solicitor General's office, I was national security advisor to the Justice Department, and we saw cases like this. And maybe not with these number of extreme documents, but even, but more minor ones. And of course, those people went to jail. Of course, they were prosecuted. And the prosecution did not take year after year the way this one appears to be going right now. Uh, I have learned a lot tonight, and uh, we're going to uh, hear this word a lot, mandamus, uh, that, you know, some of us have never said before. So we appreciate your uh, amazing analysis and making this easy for us to understand. Neil Katyal and Joyce Vance, thank you both. All right, coming up in just eight days, Donald Trump lost $3 billion from his media stock. It's almost as if the valuation of Trump media wasn't quite real. That's next. It is day eight of Donald Trump's meme stock moment. The stock debuted last Tuesday at $80 a share, but was down to $58 a share by closing time at the end of the first day. This week, after a regulatory filing showing that Trump's media, uh, Trump media's mounting losses and an independent auditor released a statement expressing, quote, substantial doubt about Trump media's ability to con continue as a going concern, end quote. Trump stock fell again to where it currently sits at about $48 a share. That is a 39 percent loss from the opening high on March 26th. The cost to Trump? Well, in eight days, Trump has lost about $3 billion from his Trump media stock. $3 billion of value disappeared. It went poof in a week. It's almost like the value wasn't really there. Now Donald Trump still has about $3.7 billion on paper, but likely has to wait six months before he can sell any of his 50% stake and 57% stake in the company. That means he would be able to cash out in October, which would be the final stretch of the presidential campaign, which would be awfully convenient. Also convenient is that the merger that has provided Trump with this Hail Mary infusion of value came courtesy of a Republican billionaire, Jeffrey Yass, who masqueraded as a never-Trumper until Donald Trump changed his position on TikTok which is an actually valuable asset that Yass personally has $21 billion invested in. Now, to any reasonable person, that looks like a convenient way for a Republican billionaire to help the Republican candidate Trump outside of campaign finance laws. As always, you will find the best people around any Trump undertaking. In fact, today, two venture capitalist, uh, capitalists pleaded guilty to insider trading that allowed Trump media to go public in the first place. 
Brothers Michael and Gerald Schwartzman knew about the 2021 deal that would allow a shell company to merge with Donald Trump's social media company to become publicly traded, and they made millions of dollars off of their insider knowledge, and they now fa face maximum sentences of 20 years each in prison. The Guardian is reporting exclusively that in 2022, the fledgling Trump media company took an emergency loan from a company that The Guardian says is a shell company for a Russian-American businessman who is under federal criminal investigation. There is no reporting, by the way, that says Trump media knew about the source of the loan, and NBC has not confirmed that reporting. But there's a lot going on here. Joining us now is Sheila Kolhatkar, staff writer for The New Yorker and a former hedge fund uh, analyst. Sheila, great to see you again. This is a tricky one. There's a lot going on. I mean, companies go public. It happens all the time. There are mergers. Companies fail. Companies don't make enough money. That it, they, they debut at a high price and they drop. But there's so many interesting little pieces to this story that it does make one go, hmm. Well, there are a lot of red flags surrounding this uh, going public situation. I mean, number one, Trump employed this shell company SPAC strategy, which is uh, its main selling point is that it allows companies to become publicly traded really quickly. There's very little vetting of the underlying business or you know, outside analysts looking at the books. It's unclear whether True Social is even a really legitimate business, to be honest. I mean, we don't really know what its business plan is or uh -huh. its plan to become profitable. And, you know, many of the stockholders here are Trump fans. You know, they they are people who just love him and want to support him and don't really care what he says or does or whether his business is successful or not. And what you really want to see when you have an IPO is a lot of long term, stable experienced investors like mutual funds, value investors moving in and owning your stock. And that is definitely not what's happened. Uh, you know, I think there are also demands of being a publicly traded company that just don't fit with Trump's ethos. It requires a lot of transparency. You're required to report audited numbers to your stockholders. You're supposed to kind of reveal what what's going on and who's making decisions. And, you know, it's safe to say that he has long been someone who likes to keep all of that uh, hidden. Let's talk a little about I, I want to be really clear. There's no allegation that Jeff Yass, who's um, said to be the richest man in, in Pennsylvania, big investor, the biggest single shareholder uh, in, in TikTok. There's no allegation. That I think there was any wrongdoing whatsoever here. It's just unusual that a guy has a big position in a in a in a in a company, TikTok. Donald Trump comes out against TikTok. These two guys apparently meet. Everybody's denied that they actually had a conversation about TikTok. Then Donald Trump changes his position on TikTok. Um, again, no, no allegations whatsoever of wrongdoing, but it's a little unusual. Well, you're right. It is unusual. I mean, the general dynamic of rich business people trying to court politicians, especially presidents who might have some influence over their Financial interest is not new, of course, and that is why, in general, uh, presidents and serious candidates are required to or requested to uh, divest of their business interests and to put their assets in things like blind trusts. And uh, Trump has you know, consistently <laughs> refused to do that, and he's got this incredible tangle of different businesses and different deals and, you know, little shenanigans he's up to. So it's created a lot of um, a lot of leeway, a lot of entry points for potential corruption or attempts to influence him in improper ways. And yeah, of course, the Yas TikTok connection connection cannot be ignored. I mean, the guy is talking his book, as they say on Wall Street. Yeah. Sheila, good to see you again. Thank you, as always, my friend. Sheila Cole Hotcar uh, is a staff writer for The New Yorker and a former hedge fund analyst. All right, coming up, more breaking news. Chef Jose Andres is speaking out as President Biden prepares to speak directly to Benjamin Netanyahu in the aftermath of the IDF killing seven aid workers from Andres' World Central Kitchen in Gaza. That's next. Tonight, the pressure is growing on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. President Biden is expected to speak by phone with Netanyahu tomorrow as the White House is promising, quote, 
tough conversations, end quote, after seven aid workers from Chef Jose Andres' World Central Kitchen, including an American, were killed Monday in an Israeli airstrike. And now, Jose Andres, who is known and loved around the world for his heroic humanitarian work, is speaking out. In a New York, New York Times op-ed and in a new interview with Reuters where he says Israeli forces targeted his aid workers, quote, systematically, car by car. The seven team members between the special uh, specialty security people we have, three British individuals and three, uh, three international crew plus one Palestinian, that they were targeted systematically, car by car. This happened over more than 1.5, 1.8 kilometers. So this was not just a bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place or, or no. This was over 1.5, 1.8 kilometers with a very defined humanitarian convoy that had signs in the top, in the roof. The humanitarians and civilians should never be paying the consequences of war. This is a basic principle of humanity. At the, at the time, this looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. A war against humanity itself. Today, the Israeli war cabinet minister, uh, cabinet member Benny Gantz, a political opponent of Netanyahu's in normal times, called for Israeli elections to take place in September, two years before the end of Netanyahu's term. This comes after Gantz made the rounds in Washington, meeting with Vice President Harris at the White House, with leaders Schumer and McConnell, and with the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. And after the canceled, uncanceled meetings between Netanyahu loyalists and the Biden administration grew heated over Israel's plans for Rafah, Axios reports the U.S. officials told the Israelis that the humanitarian crisis in Gaza that has been deteriorating over the last five months doesn't create confidence in Israel's ability to conduct an efficient and orderly evacuation of civilians from Rafah, the sources said. In addition, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, quote, warned the Israelis that in the next few weeks, the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, IPC organization, could issue a famine declaration for Gaza, two sources said. The sources said Sullivan told the Israelis that if that happens, it would be only the third such declaration in the 21st century, end quote. In his op-ed today, Jose Andres wrote, Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israeli Defense Forces. The Israeli government needs to open more land routes for food and medicine today. It needs to stop killing civilians and aid workers today. It needs to start the long journey to peace today. In the worst conditions, after the worst terrorist attack in its history, it is time for the best of Israel to show up. You cannot save hostages by bombing every building in Gaza. You cannot win this war by starving an entire population, end quote. Joining us now is David Rothkopf. He's a foreign affairs analyst and a columnist for The Daily Beast. He's also the host of the Deep State radio podcast. David, it's good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I, I've seen Jose Andres and his team in many places, in many countries, and they work very, very hard to not fall into the middle of a political conflict. I have never heard Jose Andres like this. You're absolutely right. Uh, and you could tell in the words of that op-ed that he was trying once again to show the kind of grace and generosity of spirit for which he is known. But he's also showing the anger that is completely due. Three vehicles targeted three times. The Israelis warned long in advance. The attacks taking place over a, an extended area of 2.4 kilometers. Um, uh, it's just inexcusable. Um, and uh, it is... Uh, the the hardest thing for anybody who knows Jose Andres to imagine that he would take such a strong stance unless he was not just outraged, but that he had the evidence that it was clear to him that what has happened was as wrong as he says it was. What happens next? Because when bad things happen, we get 
uh, lamentations from the White House. We get expressions from Joe Biden that really make you want to believe that he means it. And they're going to have tough conversations apparently tomorrow. What, what really happens? Because there's a, there's a really good conversation that the United States can have with Israel to say, you got to do things this way and not that way. But it doesn't ever turn out that way. Well, we are long past the time for tough conversations or for presidential expressions of outrage. Uh, it's time for the United States to use the leverage that it has with the Israelis. What does that mean? It means saying we will no longer provide offensive weapons to the Israelis, as we have done this week, weapons that can be used to bomb homes, weapons that have been used to produce the 33,000 civilian casualties that have taken place uh, in Gaza since the beginning of this war. It is time for action. The time for words is long past. And frankly, I, as somebody who is very supportive of this administration uh, in most of its other uh, activities, uh, think that the decisions that are being made now are not only wrong, they make the president look weak, they undermine U.S. interests, uh, and it's time for a real about face on policy here. There has to be a recognition that Bibi Netanyahu is part of the problem. He is not a good ally. He is a serial war criminal. He's got to go, and we've got to use every tool that we've got in our uh, uh, toolbox of leverage uh, in order to achieve that goal and to begin to help the people of Gaza, who, as you point out, are falling into famine right now at a rate we haven't seen in this century, and a million of them are at risk. David, thank you uh, for your analysis, as always. David Rothkopf is a foreign affairs analyst and columnist for The Daily Beast and the host of the Deep State podcast. We'll be right back. And that is tonight's last word. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.